Welcome to the Live Up Podcast, where we revisit the movies from our youth to see if they live up. We will review, discuss, and score whether the movie in question lives up to us now as adults and whether it lives up to the intended audience today. I'm Jess Latterman. And I'm Amanda Treat. On today's episode, we're reviewing a film that examines the inconvenient truth of an oil-dependent society devolving into an apocalyptic wasteland, while one very independent intense. frontier town leads the transition <laughs> To renewable energy. Also, you can hear Jess laughing because they have a Thunderdome. They do. Two men enter, one man leaves. It's 1985's Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Jess. That, that was like by far the most intense introduction I think you've ever given a movie. Because <laughs> it's the Thunderdome. <laughs> it's the two men enter, one man leaves. <laughs> Mad Max. It's, yeah. It's got a vibe, so uh, Jess. <laughs> vibe is a word. <laughs> Jess, you reluctantly got dragged into watching this for the first time. You've never kind of seen any of the original Mad Max movies, to my knowledge. Uh, nope. Not, this is my first. If you had to describe this movie in one word, what would it be? This was not hard for me to think about. The word is sweaty. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. I see that. There's a lot of like heat and leathery outfits and probably a lot of flies. I don't know. There's a lot of sweat. Yeah. I felt Ooh. like I needed a shower. Yeah. Yeah. So this is my first viewing. It was very sweaty. I have seen the Charlize Theron one, the recent one, but I've never seen the originals with Mel Gibson. I guess like I knew I was in for a wild ride when the opening credits have characters like Iron Bar and Pig Killer. And I'm like, what is this? Amanda. Great she... characters. Great characters. <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely texted you a bunch and I was like, so have you changed your mind about this movie? <laughs> just wanted out of this so badly. I swear to God, like our text thread was just like, what the hell is this? Movie? Well, I just was like so unsure, but I think that's the beauty of this. We, we like to revisit things that are from our youth and everybody loves and we have to see if we should still love them. So so tell me why you picked this, Amanda. Oh, my God. So I go way back with Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. But what happened was recently I was in an elevator with my very millennial coworkers and our very Gen Z interns. But but we love our millennial and, we, and Gen Z listeners, however. We right? love everybody who listens to this podcast. And we're not knocking them. But I was in this elevator with my colleagues. And I saw the headline pop up that Tina Turner had passed away. And I said out loud, oh, no, Tina Turner died. And one of my millennial coworkers was like, I don't know who that is. And then another I, I one of them. I believe you. That's Another insane. one of them was like, uh, I think she's like a singer did she have like a big song or something and like no idea and then like because our interns who are you know 20 (laughs) they were just being very polite because they're very happy to be interns and working with us and like we're just kind (laughs) of nodding but like had no idea who I was talking about so nobody knew who Tina Turner was and that just hit me right like in the soul honestly oh my god they didn't know how awesome Tina Turner was and that instantly we're gonna do something about it amanda we're we had just recorded it. our previous podcast and it was my turn to pick a movie and i was kind of waffling honestly but yeah it just hit me like oh my god we wait did it hit you do. like a thunderbolt or a like thunderbolt? a thunderbolt <laughs> that we needed to do tina turner's all-time amazing performance in mad max beyond thunderdome because she is epic as her performance in auntie in this and Jess had never seen it. So it was like a no-brainer that we had to review oh, this movie. But before before we get to that, so what is your what is your history with it though, as a kid? So obviously you and I were way too young to watch this in the theater when it came out, because I think this was a nineteen it was nineteen eighty-five. So yeah, this is not for us as children. But it's the lightest of the Mad Max movies. Like this is the funny one, everyone. Oh god. <laughs> I mean, it's just like bonkers, and bonkers. we'll get into all this in Bonker, a second. Bonkers is also a word. Yes, it's yes. yeah, just just complete craziness going on in this movie. But I I don't know when I saw this for the first time. It obviously was on someone's VHS cassette somewhere in the let's say early nineties. I probably saw it. I don't know how old I was or when I saw it for the first time. But I remember by the time I got to high school that this was a big cult classic reference point especially with like the athletes 
the two men enter, one man leaves thing was huge at my high school. But then I think it was 1996, Tupac and Dr. Dre made that music video for California Love. And it, the whole thing was Thunderdome all over again. Like they're racing across the desert and they're rapping in the Thunderdome. And it just verified that this was a cultural stamp on our generation. Like you got to see Mad Max beyond Thunderdome. So I have a lot of enthusiasm for it. Doesn't make it a good movie. I don't know. We'll see. It sounds like you remember it through the the veil of it was a cult classic yes, kind of thing yeah. versus I remember sitting down and watching it all the time. By the time everyone in high school was shouting about it, I'd probably only seen it once or twice. And okay. So you, it was already kind of classic -y by the time. Yeah. And like rewatching it now, I was just like, oh my God, I totally forgot about this part. There's movies we've reviewed like Who Framed Roger Rabbit where I could tell you every line and every scene and like I had right, it yeah. the, you know, kids watch things over and over. This was not one of those movies. I'm still very excited about it, though. You can tell in my voice, like, woo! Yeah. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome! I, I feel know. like we need to remind listeners here that you and I try not to give each other's opinion away too much before yeah. we record, although I think we have a sense. <laughs> I wasn't, like, super Debbie Downer about your choice on Thunderdome. But I was uh, a little skeptical after yeah. I watched the trailer. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. We'll start with the positive preliminary thoughts on Tina Turner in this movie. I really like that we're starting on this positive note because this movie is nothing without Auntie. She plays the character Auntie. She's kind of a queen, uh, like a literal queen of Barter Town. And she's amazing. I kind of wish she had a musical act inside the Thunderdome. That would have been awesome. But she was definitely epic, definitely iconic. I loved her in this. I know you and I texted about this. She has a great line for her backstory where she, she's telling Mad Max that I was a nobody, then I survived, now I'm somebody. But enough of history. And then like chaos ensues. There's an energy to her that just blows through the screen. It's she's fantastic. Oh. I love that line. She's like so smooth Such a good line. and slick about it, but at the same time, like very blasé, like I was a nobody. I yeah, survived. it's like she's both now like I'm sexy and dangerous. Yeah. She holds your attention so much. Every time she's on screen, it's a better scene, I think. There's a whole section in the middle where she's not in it, and that's the low point of this movie. You and I were talking before this episode. Normally, we like to do deep dives on characters and let that drive us through the movie, but this movie... All the Mad Max movies, like, people don't really talk. You can't really get a deep sense of any of these characters, because other than their, like, leather thongs and stuff, a lot you don't know what's... leather thongs. There's I can't wait it to looks... talk about the leather thongs. <laughs> the <laughs> costumes. In all of these movies, the costumes make no sense for the Australian Outback. It's like 120 degrees. This is Tina Turner wearing a chainmail dress that weighs 120 pounds, allegedly, and is just like jumping into the Thunderdome and driving a car across the Outback, like chasing, blah, blah, blah. like that dress weighs 120 pounds. Oh my God, what were they thinking? I mean, this is just one thing about the movie that doesn't make sense to me, gotta be honest. The costumes are crazy. All but, the um, men are dressed like multiple members of the village people all combined into one. It's like a village people reunion in every single costume. It's crazy. It's very odd. It's There's a lot of leather. There's a lot of bare butts, a lot of mohawks. And a lot of sweat. It yes. definitely reads in the 1980s, I guess. This is what, did this? Did they think this is what a gay leather bar looked like? Because I, I feel like that's the vibe I was getting. I feel like it's its own aesthetic. Gay yeah, Outback like, steampunk. Yeah, I said that to Elena. I was like, I feel like this is like steampunk, but with leather. She was like, my brain doesn't even understand what you're talking about. So this isn't like a, in case you fall off your motorcycle and need to slide kind of vibe. This is just, we're looking cool. But- you're not cool because it's 120 degrees and this is why they're sweaty. Really right? pack. Like, this is why my one word was sweaty. Can you so, imagine like the skin fungus that's going on under no, some of these I outfits? Can't, like, ugh. I can't even ma imagine how bad even just filming this smelled, but just if you could imagine the the world they're creating, the smell must be just unreal. I, mean, I wish we had a guest dermatologist to weigh in on this movie, <laughs> just in terms of like. Tell us about the, the and the sweating. Oh like, my God. 
Well, there so probably was like hydrocortisone all over this set, like you know, like, <laughs> and then all the so extras gross. have to be rubbed down in hydrocortisone. Oh my god, <laughs> that's so gross. Oh, that just added a whole other layer. It um, did, but it didn't because this movie was already pretty like disgusting visually and like yeah. we're feeling it viscerally. Disgusting is also a word. Um, <laughs> so we've done we've done a lot of movies where we talk about how the plot doesn't matter, but. In this case, in a weird way, yeah, some of the characters, I feel like, didn't really matter. But I am going to just go ahead and try to give a recap of what I think the plot is for those like me who have never seen it. Or maybe it just exists for you as some sort of iconic cult classic, but you don't really know that much about it. So here it goes. Um, And I, I will say I am still processing this movie I'm not sure that my brain has really cobbled everything together. Jess always gives excellent recaps. I'm very excited to hear what she says you're, right you're now. excited. Okay, <laughs> here it goes. Set your expectations lower, everybody. All right. So Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome, it imagines a post-apocalypse happening inside a hot, dusty leather bar. There's a shortage of water, but for some reason, plenty of hairspray. And a queen battles for supremacy with a man in charge of harnessing energy from pig shit. And I honestly don't know where Mad Max fits in to this description. I, I like don't understand. And I'm hoping throughout this episode, Amanda's going to make it make sense to me and to you listeners. But yes, this is where we are. We're shouty nonsense inside a leather bar in the apocalypse. <laughs> That's what this movie is. I mean, what a great movie though, right? Like, <laughs> don't you want to go to this bar and just start shouting more nonsense at them? The original movie's honestly set in like present day, which is weird, but they're wearing a lot of leather. Yeah, because doesn't like... it take place in 2021? That's, that's Maybe. What's like sort of crazy. And I should but say like... also, we are recording this episode right after each of our respective cities have been shrouded in some sort of wildfire smoke we feel this apocalypse slowly yeah creeping towards us <laughs> pretty much like i i mean i was thinking about it yesterday we were a code purple whatever the fuck that means and code maroon for air quality yeah like, i mean this almost sounds made up and i was like oh my god it's like sweaty mad max should i get out my re- leather assless chaps and just join the apocalypse really that's how you ride it out yeah <laughs> i gotta i gotta get more leather for the apocalypse i don't have enough apocalypse. leather for the apocalypse this is i don't really... either we're not prepared we gotta go shopping we, we gotta get shop. gasoline water and leather those so, are your my understanding of the mad max world timeline is that they're having an oil crisis which actually was happening in the 1970s when the first mad max came out And that it just got worse and worse to the point that countries started nuking each other over resources and that civilization has just devolved into this fight for the remaining resources. And Mad Max in the first movie has a family, has a job, but loses all of that, goes a little crazy. And now he's Mad Max. And so he just keeps popping into these mini societies in the outback in this post-apocalyptic world he just kept popping into the worst possible places saving a few people and then like going back out into the outback and wandering around and that's his whole vibe so like this is a movie where he is accidentally popping into barter town and getting sucked into their world so this is a weird thing and i know there's controversy about mel gibson as the actor but i think i like mel gibson as an actor and i feel like he almost had nothing to do here even in my like plot summary i'm like where does mad max fit in yeah it's it's all this other stuff it's all this textural stuff and mad max is this iconic character but he barely speaks. I agree with you there. Like, I think his character always shows up to observe the crazy. Like, even when it's Tom Hardy, he barely talks. Yeah. And for those who haven't seen it in a while, Mel Gibson or or Mad Max, there's moments where you see him come through and what you kind of expect in a way. I feel yeah. like there's sometimes where, like, I could see the face of Lethal Weapon and all that. But it's few and far between. He's almost a, just a supporting cast in a way. Yeah. But, He's yeah. almost, he's like the straight man in the craziest yes, scenarios. Like, that's exactly that's, what he's like. But he's, at the same, somehow he's Mad Max. He does right. totally go crazy in the first movie, but like he's our eyes and ears on the ground and he's the normal one in this really screwed up Right, because you could totally, this movie could be called Mad Auntie. Mad or Tina Turner. Mad yeah. Tina Turner could be Mad Auntie or Master or 
fucking pig farm or whatever the hell that shit is. So, I mean, there's there's madder people. There's crazier people in this than yeah. Mad Max. No, he's our normal tour guide through, like, this weird, crazy place we're going. And as you're saying, like, we're not going to really deep dive into all the characters. We're just sort of, I think gonna go by section yeah this movie very distinctly has first act we're in barter town second act we're hanging out with the kids in the ravine third act we're doing a giant chase across the outback and will they live will they die but like it's very sectional yeah and the characters they're not talking a lot or the people who are talking shouldn't be talking (laughs) when they do talk i was like I feel like you just spoke English and I understand those individual Uh, words, but I'm not sure I understand what it means when it's a full sentence. But so but take us to take me through the first section, because I I actually I need your help here, because even though I've seen it now once, I'm like, what? No, but like (laughs) if this was your first time seeing Mad Max, any Mad Max or any of the original Mad Maxes, like we just dropped you into a lot of crazy right here crazy we dropped you into the thunderdome and like first they don't tell you between these two movies that there's been like a nuclear apocalypse then it starts getting referenced a lot and beyond thunderdome but like there's no explanation that that has happened so you're just taking it i mean this could just be a bad day in australia for all we know but like it's <laughs> not you and i both lived in australia for a little while like this right, is right. not actually australia no This movie starts with Max in his crazy, it's the vehicle he had in the first two movies, but it doesn't work anymore. So he's having his modified, like, formerly kick-ass car dragged by camels across the outback. There's, like, dust storms, and he's dressed like Lawrence of Arabia, and I'm not kidding. I think they're invoking a lot of old movies here, so, like, there's... A plane that starts dipping down on him because they ultimately steal his car, even though it's not functional, and leave him stranded in the outback. But it looks like north by northwest. He's running away from the plane as it dips down on him, and then he pops back up. But he's wrapped up in all of this cloth because he's in 120 degree Cooper PD or wherever the hell they're supposed to be. Yeah, they're in like the middle of Australia. It's like, yeah sweaty nonsense so it starts off like very shaky overhead camera work but you zoom in on max he's in the middle of nowhere he's got this car it's being dragged by camels this plane swoops down and steals it and they're kind of attacking him like what the hell is going on so he drags himself without his car over to barter town which is the closest available town and this is where Jess's head is blowing up. I'm watching her make facial expressions at me as I'm saying this. If you Tell didn't know about Barter what Town, Amanda, was, I want to hear what you thought of Barter Town when you first watched this as a as a young person. I mean, I can't remember my specific memory of it, but here's how it's ingrained in me. This is why we need to fight climate change, people. <laughs> because you do not want to go to Barter Town, people. I think this is, this is how. It ends for all of us if we don't fix climate change. <laughs> like that, oh there's this God. small that's town so that's run like the wild, wild west in the middle of the Australian outback, and it's still 120 degrees, and people are still running around in their leather thongs, and they're shooting each other in the street, and like it's just chaos, and the whole thing's being run off of an anaerobic digester because they have a lot of pigs. So you know what? Small kudos to them for figuring out renewable energy <laughs> on that scale in the middle of nowhere but they're still just like letting chaos reign this whole place there's this opening shot of people filing in to go to work there and i don't know if anyone else has seen this movie but that there's that 1960 version of the movie the time machine not the new one with guy pierce that we saw that's it, not even new anymore that's like 25 years old but there's this version we had to see in school because it's based on the book and like the way the like waifs are dragging themselves into the dark pit all in a line and just looks so depressing. And they kind of recreate that shot. Mel Gibson as Max gets in the line like we got to go into Barter Town. You can't smell things from watching a movie, but you can somehow smell this place. Oh, yeah, because like, everybody's sweaty. Yeah. It runs on pig shit. It is a post-apocalypse hellscape i mean this is what we're headed to people it sometimes reminded me of how they've depicted uh settlements in the walking dead in a way when it's like run by a bunch of outlaws it's crazy yeah total chaos people are in leather for some reason 
I mean, it's a hellscape. It's not the suburban hellscape we talked about in Edward Scissorhands. It is like way fucking worse. No, this is a literally you're about to get beaten to death hellscape. Like, oh it's yeah, it's gross. it's gross. I kept thinking in my head like the whole Dunkin' Donuts tagline of America runs on Dunkin', and I'm like, oh, this is a far Our town a far runs fall. on pigs. The apocalypse runs on pig shit, everybody. <laughs> See, here's where I want to actually give this a positive spin because I used to work for the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and I worked for their anaerobic digester program. We were giving out grant money for Which people to put in another generators. Way shit, I guess. I don't know. But this movie is actually describing renewable energy. They have propped up a town based on the fact that they can turn feces into methane and run a generator off it and run the whole damn town and in my head i was like nobody's calling that an anaerobic digester but that's what they're doing here and like kudos they have some kudos to solid auntie. engineering despite all their leather despite like, all their leather auntie was able to yeah figure it out with that master guy I don't yeah know. don't let the leather deceive you these guys have engineering degrees and they have built an anaerobic digester and it runs the whole town like wow good for them oh. <laughs> God, so it doesn't weird. smell good. None of this smells good. So, so Auntie, uh, aka Tina Turner, she runs this place, and for some reason, Mad Max is like in the mix. Of, he he shows up and he's that. like he's desperate because he's lost his car, he's lost his camels. He shows up in Barter Town where you have to barter something or else, or they don't they'll send you away to die. So he basically barters himself. Like I can fight. Max kicks some ass and they are impressed and they say, all right, bring him up to auntie. First of all, her entrance, there's just sexy saxophone playing and shadows. But it's like weird 80s sexy saxophone. Oh, I it's mean, total 80s sexy It's so saxophone. cheesy in a way. It was weird. The saxophone to me was weird. Like the whole score was part sexy saxophone, but like shitty 80s sexy saxophone. <laughs> so it's like part shitty jazz club, part Roman battle cry, and then part Looney Tunes. Just fucks with your senses, the music. The actual soundtrack for this is done by Maurice Jarr. He is this Oscar winning composer. He did Lords of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago. At the same time he's doing this, he's doing movies like Dead Poet Society. He does these like very serious epics. And that is not what this movie is at all. This movie is meant to be chaos. I just felt even watching that final chase scene, I was thinking about the newest Mad Max movie and it was like yeah the music was keeping me going like it's this heart pounding soundtrack where right, you're just like heavy ah. metal in the new one and I oh yeah like, I mean they have a guitar player with like flames coming out of the guitar in the new one that's the level of soundtrack right. we're going for in these car chases and this like this soundtrack is too it's, subdued it's it's subdued but you had like elements of like looney tunes or something it almost had a cartoonish element yeah it that. just and, Didn't and do you know it for we me. don't get super nerdy with the music on this podcast but this the music outside of Tina Turner the actual score to me was distracting cuz yeah. it was so weird yeah. yeah so he shows up he gets sent to see auntie Tina Turner she emerges in her amazing 120 pound chain link not chain link she's a chain, chain link friend <laughs> It's not a chain link fence, although that would have been very revealing. This is also a very revealing dress. Yeah. She shows up in her uh, chain mail dress. Her boobs are popping out. Looks so fucking it's like bad. You're really trying to sell this to me, Amanda. I'm I not. Know, like, I know I'm, I'm just trying to podcast, sell Tina Turner, but... honestly. Tina Turner wins this movie. <laughs> yeah, and she's in this power struggle with the mass, the guy who runs the pig shit energy operation. And she, I guess what I gleaned is that she sort of hires Mel Gibson to kill him. So it's Master Blaster, and it's a great name. It's kind of, a, yeah, kind of iconic. It is a smaller engineer who sits atop this giant, but as they get into the Thunderdome. we mean little person. Yeah, they basically, Tina Turner's character, Auntie, wants to take out the larger enforcer side of the operation because she thinks that she can control the guy who is the engineer, who is smaller and can't put so, up a fight without I gotta the say, bigger I didn't guy. even understand that. I thought that, yeah. I, I didn't even understand that. I thought that Mel Gibson was supposed to kill both of them. No, so she I was like, what the fuck the deal guy. is making? I don't get it. Then they're in the iconic Thunderdome. Yeah. And it's Master versus that big guy, right? No, like, it's 
No, not master. Sorry. It's, it's Mil- blaster. It's the, blaster, it's the yeah. big guy who never talks. He's just got a helmet on his head and he's huge. And he's just there as the muscle guy. And that's who auntie Tina Turner wants taken out. Cause she feels like she can control the whole town. Once that guy's out of the picture. Yeah. So that's the, the challenge. That okay, so first of all, I didn't even understand that because this yeah, no, they're just hard. mumbling their way through the whole thing. This movie is hard to understand. I mean, there's yeah. so many points where it's like I don't even understand the words coming out of their mouth, and I, I, it struck me that you probably have to watch this movie over and over in order to just kind of go with this fucking bonkersness. But the Thunderdome itself, I could see it as iconic. It's like set up like one of those playground structures in a way, but it's all yeah, metal. it's just a dome. It's like a Geo. yeah but there's there's like people are hanging from it because it's all set up and there's yeah there's it's basically hunger game style there's weapons at the top and mel gibson and this weird fucking guy master or blaster rather yeah they're attached by they're on bungee cords. cords wait and and to me that was just that's where the vegas comes in because i'm like oh my god like the hunger games just got into cirque du soleil so weird i think that's oh, what captured happening? so many people about this movie it was just all right like gladiator style we're gonna fight but the second they right. put them on bungee cords and there's a chainsaw hanging from the ceiling and spears but you gotta like bounce up to them and all this random weaponry and all the spectators can climb up the side of the dome and just scream through it it just took on this intensity they're doing air ballet to try to kill each other like it's yeah amazing it's- looking it's yeah the stunts the stunts there are phenomenal i'll I'll give you that the stunts are phenomenal but it's just so fucking weird i mean yeah this whole scene messed with my senses too because there is a ballet quality to how they're fighting and being gladiators but it's so fucking weird it's so weird listeners it's like there's chainsaws with cirque du soleil ballet i what the fuck it's just blew my little brain i just couldn't even like take it all in and part of it didn't make sense to me because it's like then that there's an MC right? and like he's and the, got his like showgirls behind him and they're giving the hype speeches. I mean, it's not the hype speeches is he's like, you know, look at us now and then says a bunch of words. I, I didn't even write down the words. It was just he gives a speech that's supposed to be some sort of pivotal, like as if this some this is some pivotal moment. And I'm like, what are you fucking saying? What? <laughs> I feel like they do this in barter town every saturday night though like i feel like that same speech those two girls the chainsaws hanging from the ceiling that this is just like regular entertainment for them i don't know there are so many questions for me i just it's a good scene and obviously mel gibson or max wins so but he wins but sort of wins sort of wins yeah Yeah. and i didn't even understand that whole i explained it to me amanda i just don't fucking get it all right. Well, and like, <laughs> here's the thing too. Like, I think you feeling disoriented by all of this is the point. I think part of this Give film this series a lot of credit. <laughs> no, no, no. But like, I think Max keeps landing in these societies that have set themselves up in a certain way and made up all sorts of weird shit. He's just trying to roll with it, but at the same time, it's just like, what the hell, bungee cords? And there's a chainsaw up there, and if I bounce really high, I can get the chainsaw. It's just yeah. like chaos, absolute chaos. chaos. And he's just trying to roll with it because uh, I just want my damn car back. The stakes yeah. are really high for like, very low reward for him. I'm, I'm watching Jess's face here because she's just like, what the F is with this movie? And like, I, 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 I agree with you. I totally agree with you. Like, this is not supposed to make sense, but you're supposed to just feel like I've been thrown into chaos. I got to get out of the chaos. Like, here we go. And so they're I mean, fighting. I definitely felt that. And, yeah. and then, you know, throughout the fight scene, the helmet gets removed. Yeah. So and, it's and- revealed that Blaster... Max figures out earlier he's actually very sensitive to high-pitched noises that Max has a whistle with him when he goes into the Thunderdome and he knows the weakness of his opponent so if he can just blow the whistle the guy freaks out knocks his helmet off and realizes oh wait this is somebody who's like intellectually disabled and this is not morally right to be killing somebody so he turns to auntie and is like nope no deal not killing this guy at which point Tina Turner leaps into the Thunderdome. She <laughs> looks 
so cool. Like, it's not, she she's the bad cool. guy in this movie, and I gotta call that out over and over again. I'm no, no, she does her. look cool. And this is the moment where I was like, oh, I just wish she would just start singing. This is where I wanted the concert. I wish she would kick everyone's ass. She's not supposed to be the fighter, but if she just put a he- high heel through Max's chest or something, end a movie, but we'd all be happy. I think I might have been happy. I'll just overall say that I understand why it's iconic. It is interesting looking. But there is just so much word salad. And I feel like seeing it for the first time as an adult, I was like, what the fuck is happening? It's not just the chaos. I still didn't get like, am I supposed to be rooting for Mad Max? He's fighting for his car, but that feels just so low stakes. Yeah. That, that piece just just didn't come together for me. And and then when, you know, Tina Turner's getting mad at him and she's amazing and she's like flies into the Thunderdome, which is cool. Totally cool. It looks it looks cool. It, it does look cool. cool. I totally get it. It was honestly hard for me to root for Mad Max in a way because I'm like, I just don't know if I care. The stakes generally for the apocalypse feel high. I still was just like, oh my God, explain to me why he's Mad Max at this point. Because like, yeah, but he doesn't seem yeah. that mad at this point. He's a little tame Max. Yeah, a little bit. And I don't mean to get like over intellectual about it, but I just no, have a hard, do it. I do it. <laughs> but I had a hard time connecting with him because I yeah. just didn't. I was like, I don't fucking get it. No, that's totally what the character, like, after that first movie, and like, honestly, God, the first movie is really hard to watch. I don't recommend anyone go back to it, even yeah, though it's rated like 97% also... or some bullshit on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, oh my God, the second movie is also really hard to watch, and I had yeah. a hard time getting no, it. No, it's yeah. like, he's an okay at best guy but like he hits the point where he goes crazy because his wife and oh god they just keep killing all of his dogs in all of these movies it's like john wick but times three it's the worst and he like loses his mind he wants to be alone in the outback he keeps wandering into situations where he's like ah god damn it all right i'll save these stupid idiots but he at this but, like he that's gets- a hard hard person to latch on to <laughs> yeah i totally get gets- it he gets himself exiled essentially yeah so he breaks the deal with auntie he refuses to kill blaster the big guy so tina turner's assassins take him out she jumps in the ring and she's like we're gonna do the wheel because now max is... oh the wheel I yeah about now the, the max wheel. i mean like so kind of a better game of wheel of fortune than actual wheel of fortune you gotta wait there they spin the wheel like what's his punishment gonna be and it's the gulag which uh this is not the actual definition of a gulag i was like so, the gulag and then he's off on a horse in the we're night. like oh they're sending him to russia no right that's not. what i was thinking <laughs> bind him they sit him backwards on a horse and they put this weird mask on his head and then just pat the horse and off it goes into the desert uh and yeah. then the horse dies of thirst which sort of the sucks, horse but... dies of thirst and then immediately sinks into i'm just gonna keep calling it the sarlacc pit i know we're in yeah. the wrong movie trilogy here but like that's okay it's same era though so yeah it works. starlack eats the horse and max escapes because he has a faithful pet monkey somebody sent after him although he Which is immediately also like, from another trilogy of this yeah like he falls on the monkey repeatedly and my husband kept going like he crushed the monkey to death it was like <laughs> it's very concerned we were waiting and it was like oh no there's the monkey again all right the monkey's still in the, the monkey's okay the monkey's sure. okay all right so unlike in indiana jones where it gets yeah. poisoned this is where the movie takes a really slow not exciting turn so max he's sent out into the desert his horse sinks into a sarlacc pit and he gets rescued by these creepy ass children creepy very blonde they're very tan they can barely speak english like barely speak i mean that's the crux of it here oh god what are they saying amanda i was thinking about this in the apocalypse do we just like lose our ability for language like what's happening I mean, is this the equivalent of texting, but like apocalypse? Like they're all speaking in like CLDR, like and LOL. Just standing there like, like, what are they fucking fuck saying? saying? The movie just slows to a crawl at this point because he's dealing with these chaotic children. I do not like this whole 
tangent. It was, I found it really hard to understand. And, yeah. and not just where the place was in the plot. There's nothing charming about it. And it could no. be charming because it's kids. Some of the kids that. are genuinely cute. Like the same way as some of the, or the last boys from Hook are cute. Yeah. But they're saying nonsense. Nonsense. Like. Like the, and this is where the grammar's all messed up. But then it makes it really hard to follow. I was noting that in Star Wars, when C-3PO is in the third movie, the Ewoks. Talking worship, to the Ewoks. That's exactly what this right. is. They're oh like, my God. But the Ewoks worship C-3PO. And the Ewoks don't speak English. They're literally just grunting and have gestures God, but i that's feel such like a good they're comparison okay but they're their grunts and gestures i could understand it and i understand what's going on i, I understand the ewoks oh, more man. than whatever the fuck these kids are saying I, I guess the purpose is that it's been far enough away from civilization that they don't really have like a basic understanding of things but, like, but it, it's this literally whole... hard to understand them and i don't understand they think that mel gibson's character mad max is some sort of a long lost leader that's why it reminded me of c-3po but it it was so convoluted that i didn't follow it i didn't find them charming at some point there's some sort of inter-kid battle and i just didn't get it yeah it was just so weird now this whole section sinks the movie they're trying to build up this narrative of we have this tribe of children but they're the descendants of this plane crash but at the same time it's like we're the f for the adults like there are literal babies running around them there's 18 year olds and there's three year olds. They're just like, oh yeah, no, all of the adults left. There's no explanation where the hell the adults went. They all left. Like right, they just left their kids. To, but I think that you're supposed to glean kind of that that's sort of the plot that they, yeah. they were sort of abandoned and that this is the ties into the whole apocalypse thing and that they develop some sort of culture around the origin story of of the plane crash and i think that in another movie or in another setting it could be interesting i just wanted to note here that i did not watch this movie with my children That's i have to say good probably a probably good, good. Move. good so move. for the parents out there i just don't think it's gonna work but it wasn't because i thought it wasn't gonna work I was actually so naive that I actually was planning on watching it with them. It just didn't work out with our family plans. But but I think that my kids like to connect with those other kids. And they they understand things like the Skeksis in Dark Crystal. They're to, they totally get it, even though they're only saying things like, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. They, they totally get the Ewoks. So my kids, or just kids in general, I think could be okay with nonsense language in a way that bothers us as adults. I feel like but there's these no kids, way. Yeah no way that they would have related to this because it just made no sense it wasn't funny it there was nothing kid like about them there's a girl who's like the storyteller of the whole group but she's given way too much time to give this nonsense exposition that total is word meaningless salad. yeah it just like nobody cares they're going on about captain walker who flew the plane blah blah blah, blah. and like yeah just a bunch of gibberish it has no impact on the plot whatsoever and it doesn't even honestly seem to have any impact on max he's just like well this is the best thing i've come across in all these random places i've wandered into in the outback so he like doesn't want the kids to leave either and when a few of them are like oh wait you came from somewhere we're going there he flat out punches a girl in the face at one point yeah he ties up some girl he's super aggressive with the kids so again there's nothing charming about it and i'll say i don't think kids today this would land at all because no. they, they, it's just who is this fucking guy in leather who's punching kids what the fuck is happening he's not you know? a people person and he would <laughs> you'd call the department of children you need to be a people person him. in the apocalypse i don't yeah. know <laughs> and like these kids are super annoying and not very relatable either and here's the thing originally this was the movie it was supposed to be an apocalypse version of the lost boys or an apocalypse version of an adult coming across a lord of the flies situation oh god and they <laughs> turned it into a mad max movie but originally this was the movie there's no way this movie would have been a cult classic if no. they did what you described i mean you need it that sucks. other stuff in there it so totally this, sucks i would venture to guess that any person you know gen x older millennial who thinks fondly of this movie they don't think fondly of this movie because of this middle bit so then you were saying they basically decide that some of them want to go to barter town so so take us there take yeah us back all right America. so some of them because their whole reason for being 
these kids is they think there is a better place although they are living in a very like verdant like there's a right, river they're living in the there's gardens they're in a very nice place for the apocalypse and i do think that this is the place for the charlie Theron movie um, she was trying to get to maybe that she was trying to get to so yeah. i assume that her character is supposed to be one of these kids yeah and meanwhile these kids are like no like if we could just get back to sydney in 19 19- 90 or whatever or 2021 when it's like yeah like fucking radiated we want to go back to that civilizations and mel gibson's bad max keeps saying like that's not a thing anymore like literally (laughs) atomic bombs have dropped and it all blew up that's not a thing but all right so half of them decide since he came from bar town they're gonna go there which is the dumbest idea ever dumbest idea ever stay, he's stay in your very violent in his don't go chasing of waterfalls don't, yeah know. he's very violent in his enforcing of don't go chasing waterfalls he punches <laughs> the girl in the face he like ties up kids and gags them while he falls asleep they all manage to escape anyway and they're off they're just bolting across the outback in peak heat Dave. Um, these days during apocalypse so max wakes up and is like oh they left (laughs) so he's gonna do the right thing and try to go wrangle them he brings some tiny kids with him with their tiny spears it's supposed to be cute and shit but like it's not these kids are useless like useless and what's weird about it is that i was sort of like why is he trying to go after the girl that he punched in the face like so there's a there there's real disjointed plot here and it, again, me having not seen it, so I don't no, have this it, nostalgic attachment. I'm, I'm like, with you. It's like, why wouldn't that? you just let her go? Like, let you her know go. What? You idiots, you her. go die. Go die on your go way to Barter the- Town. They're going <laughs> to just stick you in the Thunderdome anyway. It's going to be a hot mess. Like, mm. Yeah, you're going to shovel some pig shit. I don't but, know. But, oh, Max, in his heart, he has to do the right thing. So he takes some tiny oh, little helpers along. And <laughs> tiny little helpers. Oh, they're God. trekking across the outback. They find the kids halfway sucked into the Sarlacc pit. He pulls them out, and then they're all, like, just sleeping in the middle of the desert and they see the lights of Barter Town. So, okay, we're going there. We have no plan. We have no purpose. Like, what the F are we doing? But that, I mean, that's sort of a problem for me because I, I was sort of like, what is the plan? They basically ambush or they attack Barter Town. They don't. They just, they sneak in through the pipes. All right, they do right, is but like, they, yeah. But there's this intention sneak. of destroying it. And this is what I didn't understand because it's, this is where the plot was so disjointed where, okay, they are going to barter town because they want to live there. But now that they're there, they, they almost seem to, that they're invading it and wanting to destroy it. So I was sort of confused as to what is the point? Like what are literally what the fuck is the plan? Yeah. They see master who's the, <laughs> the aerobic digester engineer yeah. at this point, for some reason decided to rescue him, even though we were literally fighting him the last time we saw him. That was another question I had because I just didn't understand why they were on the master's side. Yeah. But I guess they are, they're on the master's side against the auntie character who runs Barter Town. And right. so there's this whole thing where the kids basically with with Mad Max want to destroy the town. And I, I and like none of this is being communicated out loud. And like I literally uh, having seen this before. And I just literally wrote, what the fuck is going on? I found slight amusement in this because as a parent, if you've ever brought your own children plus other people's kids to a playground or something, the kids immediately disperse and go crazy and they run everywhere and you can't keep track of any of them. Do you and end I... up with a train and you're being chased by Tina Turner and like a... <laughs> right? But I guess I found that kind of funny is that Mad Max all of a sudden is in the position of he's the dad with all these other kids that aren't his own and like, being like, damn it. I where is everybody? Like, who's... Do you have a buddy? Does there a buddy? Ah, what are you doing with the pigs? Get What's out! on? <laughs> This whole scene, there's no plan. There's no goal. They just end up, like, just swinging around. They kick a few people into the pig shit. Like, there's one guy who pops out of it and spitting pig shit out of his mouth. I felt that viscerally. He didn't go to work today. Signed up for that. Like, oh, it's so good. That guy. In a previous pop down to the underworld, Mad Max had befriended Pig Killer. He just said, I killed a pig because I was trying to feed my family. So Pig Killer is like, yeah, let's blow this place up. And Passive like, aggressive what? employee there. So, like, <laughs> he's helping them out. He knows how to steal a train that'll lead out of there. And then suddenly we come 
bursting out of the underworld on this kind of truck train thing, but it's on a track. They're all hopping onto this thing. It's coming out of this cave-like situation where all the pigs are and somehow blowing up everything behind it. So like, yeah, they're like, kind of like utter yeah. chaos. There's explosions. There's, there's a car chase. This is where the, the big car chase comes this, in. There's, there's it's cars. not even, it's a train car plane chase that happens Crazy. after they come busting out of barter town like it just goes so mayhem it's awesome yeah it doesn't make sense but it's awesome i guess it's visually awesome and i guess this is part of the plot that i could actually follow tina turner there has gathered up all the people in their crazy homemade vehicles where things are just welded onto other things and everything looks crazy there's a cow car i don't know why one of the cars looks like a cow but it's a car big ass chase scene comes bursting out of this whole mel gibson with a bunch of kids in a tunnel full of pigs thing and this is again where the plot just like didn't fucking matter because then then tina <sighs> turner on auntie she's getting in these cars and it's like well why the fuck are they chasing them because they're leaving right so it's like this weird vengeance thing too it's basically car chase for the sake of a car chase and it's hard to understand the stakes well, of no, like why they she, it. she's trying to recapture master the guy who's oh, like the engineer i don't even get that they oh, grabbed God. him put him on the train and they're blowing out of this joint and she needs him because he knows how to run oh my god digester. you just like fix the movie for me in a way because i was like what the yeah. fuck is happening yeah no all she wants is to get that guy back she doesn't yeah. particularly care about max at this point she definitely doesn't care about these stupid kids like she just wants the guy who knows how to she, keep she the power the on the and shit guy. so it, yeah. in all this chaos and like yeah. plot disjointed plot i completely missed that well it's not clear because they're punching each other in the face we're not supposed to ask questions we're supposed to be like wow that's a badass looking car like that's it it turns into a gearhead movie immediately after they burst out of there but it's also a gearhead movie that still has that gay leather bar feel to it oh what makes it so funny because a lot of these tina turner's guards are wearing feathers in their hair it's like a thanksgiving parade gone so wrong i kind of want to see a version of that final chase scene set to queens i want to break free oh my god wouldn't that be amazing i mean i part of me feels like there has to be some sort of gay leather bar thunderdome theme bar somewhere in the united states i bet Um, there is you and i are not invited to it as ladies but like it's probably amazing my gay ass into one of those places but yeah if you find out about this let me know i'll go like well there's also a moment where like one of the very sweaty and feather filled guards basically kisses master of both men and i wrote down in my notes i knew this movie was gay as hell a little (laughs) yeah there's a lot of guys out there who are like i love this movie and will never admit to that but the gay vibe is strong in this movie but but i think a lot of straight men love this movie and i oh yeah slightly funny so because it's like this whole oh it's so tough it's the apocalypse you gotta fight yourself to death and they're tuning out the guys in the thongs who are sweating and muscly it's sort of like this macho fever dream especially the chase scene yeah. here oh god and yeah. it's it's all the macho things it's welding it's driving really fast it's really good with weapons where does it cross over from macho fever dream to gay <laughs> I hope I don't get hate mail for this. I'm sorry. No, it's spot on. <laughs> like in the apocalypse, all men become closeted gay men. And that's sort of what I'm, that was my takeaway. You Eleven. know what? Like if Tina Turner's allowed to dress all of her employees, she's just like, <laughs> you know what? I'm wearing 120 pounds of chain mail, motherfuckers. You are going to wear some leather thongs and go and down see your butt cheeks. into the underworld. See. It's 120 <laughs> degrees above ground. I'm going to stick you in the pit. Work it. Yeah. Work it. So I generally like, I liked the car chase scene. I thought it was good. Yeah. I feel like I've seen better. Even the one we saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark, I thought was better, actually, because it made just, like, more narrative sense. There's just not enough plot there to keep me. Whereas I feel like in the new one with Charlie Theron, there was enough plot there that I accepted the ridiculousness of the car chase. I see that it was mm-hmm. cool. I see that it was iconic. But I'm like, I don't know who I'm rooting for. I'm kind of rooting for Tina Turner. <laughs> so I Yeah, no, I mean, she's... It. 
amazing bad guy and like we get to the end of all this and there's a reprisal of the guy with the airplane and his kids show up at the end who by the way that guy with the airplane was in the second movie they float everyone up and fly them out except they don't have enough space to clear the runway so max jumps it back into the vehicle and plows a line through so they can take off and they ultimately fly to a devastated sydney where everything must be super toxic because of the bombs that's a boring way to end but the awesome ending for tina turner is max plows his car through their whole line (laughs) there's cars flipping over and he ends up jumping out of the car so he survives the big ass crash but tina's standing over him with her goons at the end and she makes a smarmy comment and like grins and winks at him and walks off and leaves him and like but I don't understand. Why did she leave him? Because she doesn't care about him at all. It was just like, master? hey. But she no, get she doesn't get Master. Too. Master's in the plane. Master goes to Sydney yeah, with kids. Yeah, so I, I, that's whatever. what I didn't get at the end. She's just sort of like sexy wink. They like sexy wink at each other. And then yeah. that's it. No, she's just flirty bad guy. Like, we'll do this again. I don't know. I like I, that I ending for her. setting it up for another sequel that never happened. Maybe, but yeah, I just like the idea that they didn't need to kill her at the end of this thing. She can exist out there and just go back and rebuild her dictatorship over Barter Town and like, I mean, yeah, fine. <laughs> it's so funny because so so now we're at the end of the movie and part of me wrote down like, wait, how did this end? It obliterated my senses to the point where I just didn't even remember the <laughs> end. I was like, who won? Who won? Did Tina Turner win? Did Mel Gibson win? I don't get it. Well, who won? Yeah. I really, again, think this is where if someone has nostalgia for this movie, yeah, they just, maybe I should ask you the question. No, that's, all right. So the ending is he Yeah, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> no. He sacrifices himself to get everybody out of yeah. the situation. They go off to Sydney and they're living their boring lives out there. But like when he's <laughs> the confronting kids. Tina. Terrible kids. Yeah, oh. no, he's just like, you stupid kids get out of this movie. He and Tina have that moment. She, as this epic bad guy, is just like, you know what? You're a good nemesis, and that was a cool move, and you're not the one I'm here to, like, kill, so good day, sir. Kudos. That was nicely done. And just walks off and leaves them stranded in the desert. I like that as an ending, where she's just like, wink, nod, hey, good game, sir. Like, you know, handshake, yeah. I will fight you in the future again. Yeah, that seems I guess right for her. I feel like there's somewhere in there, there's probably a good movie. Or and just even, it, even her rise to power. Yeah, like that whole no. thing in the beginning. I was a nobody, I survived, and now I'm a somebody. Like yeah. that, there's a good movie in there somewhere. And I would and, love a and prequel, this wasn't like it. <laughs> Auntie. Yeah, like an Auntie, Auntie prequel. I would see Auntie. I don't even care who they can't. I mean, I don't know if you could possibly replace her. But you, that I could that I could get behind. I don't know my 42 year old brain was like in fucking pieces by the end of this movie and I was just I couldn't <laughs> put it back together I couldn't and I spent days trying to I you know I watched it about a week ago and I've been trying to like just piece it together in my mind a mutual friend of ours from college I saw and their husband was so excited that we were going to do this movie and nice, he wanted to watch nice. it and he was like oh this is great and he's like this is so good it's so such an iconic movie all of them are yeah. so great so I was like kind of like okay I'm into it like my brain still even talking to you it's like leaking out of my ear i'm on my second ear i don't i, I don't maybe i just like i am simultaneously like me, i'm Amanda. i'm a little bit sorry but mostly psyched that this broke your brain it like, broke I'm, my brain it's i'm sorry but really happy about totally that totally broken <laughs> I'm still broken by it. We were saying at the beginning of this podcast that, you know, we're recording this right after we had this plume of smoke over yeah. your city of Boston and our city of DC. And it just puts you in the apocalypse mood. There is still a resonance to, I don't think it's going to take, we just went through a pandemic. It does not no. take much for society to break down to fucking nothing. No. And, and like, and, think- and then it to me, it's not just where society breaks down. It's like, where do you go from society to assless leather chaps? Because that's where, for some reason, <laughs> that's the one headed. piece we're all missing. <laughs> no, there's definitely, there were moments during the pandemic, 
awful. Did Jeremy, your husband, put on his assless chaps and he's like, I'm ready for the Thunderdome. No, he was ready to fight the guys in the assless chaps. <laughs> like we were we were doomsday prepping. It used to be zombie prepping, but now it's assless chaps prepping. Yeah, I no. think that like my headline is is that I need more leather for the next pandemic, obviously. That's the lesson we're learning here. Oh god. So this was the movie and it broke my brain, but you have some fun trivia for us. Um, so this is all a George Miller production. He did all of the Mad Max movies, including the most recent one that we keep referencing with Charlize Theron. But he also did all of the Babe and the Happy Feet movies. So like he goes from this apocalyptic murder rapey to like a talking pig who gets along with sheep. It's so pleasant and adorable. That's the weirdest career track I've heard of of any director. <laughs> so like good for him other cool things about this movie you know that i love my special effects all of the sandstorms in this are real that that was crazy to me that yeah all, they're all real so you and i both lived in australia but i did i was further out there than you were have you ever been in an australian sandstorm no it's, i mean i've been excruciating to... <laughs> <laughs> I've been to like the middle part of Australia, but not yeah. at a, not in this area. Yeah, I had a day of work where we were outside during a sandstorm, and it. I just remember like I had a bandana over my mouth and nose because you could not breathe, and it was just getting like rocks in your eyes the whole time. I just appreciate the attention to detail that they're doing with practical effects. Like again, this is. 1985 they don't have computer generated anything they're just really blowing up all that stuff they're really rigging up all those cars they had that final chase scene they had to make tina turner a special car because she couldn't do stick shift i don't know i i nerd out on stuff like that but it looked cool because it was real like they really did those chases and that was so much fun genuinely what i appreciate about old, like older movies from the 80s and 90s is that there's so much that could be accomplished by CGI, but it but when you do the CGI stuff in modern movies, it takes the danger away. It takes the stakes away. Yeah. I don't need it to look perfect. It looks more dangerous because it, it is, really is not yeah. CGI and not just because you know there's people filming it, but it just has an element of real yeah. that you can't capture in CGI. I, and so I think that that is cool i thought it was well done there's real dust that's coming up from the tires it definitely adds to an element of that is good and this is the yeah. only positive thing i'm going to say about this movie for the most part <laughs> um that and tina turner so that that i did appreciate yeah in, in a way so i have to give the production credit i was pulled into this world in some ways i feel like i'm still in the world i'm still thinking Ooh. about it oh, i need to get you out of there head it's it's definitely get on like, the plane jess go to sydney i know i was definitely thinking about it for a while it, it definitely pulled me in and i i have to give it credit for that kind of world building yeah yeah if you said oh i saw this mad max style car like you'd know exactly what they meant it's its own look it's its own world it's super cool it's such a gearhead thing and <laughs> Jess and yeah. I are not particularly gearheads, but like the way they're no, bringing up these I am cars. Not and, like... and, and I'll say that the other good thing I thought, found about it, I don't really care about effects for the most part, the way that you like your face melting and all that shit. Oh, but love it. Yeah. I feel like I need more story. And there was one moment that I thought was really good where the chase scene is happening and the master pig shit master guy is with a bunch of kids and he finds a vinyl, he finds record, a vinyl record yeah. player. And they, they're just playing like what sounds like a hooked on phonics French lesson. It's a good moment because you just sort of realize what was lost in the apocalypse. So yeah. clearly him as an adult is like understanding what this is. And the, and the kids in the car have like no fucking idea what they're listening to. And there there is a moment of sadness and, oh, we have to fight for something like civilization. It, this moment, I thought it was a good part of the movie but it lasted like 30 seconds yeah. so... <laughs> no because it's going on in the middle of this huge chase scene but it was but definitely yeah, a, it's a coherent coherent moment. it was a coherent moment and i feel like i wanted the whole movie to feel more like that we're focusing on the good that's like... all i got for the good that's it oh dear all that's right it. all right <laughs> obviously tina turner is i just love the fact that some movie director came to her and was like hey you're making this post-apocalyptic movie and you would be the bad guy and 
you're going to be wearing this extremely heavy chainmail dress and have this completely crazy wig full of hairspray and you're going to be overlord of this gritty horrible town are you in and tina turner's like hell yes and i want to <laughs> sing the opening song and i want to sing the end credits but she leaned in so hard on the crazy and i love it like i love this about her so yeah tina turner absolutely rest showed peace, up tina turner. rest in peace um for me the good the fight sequences like everything going on oh. in thunderdome is just like bonkers bananas but that's such cool choreography you're very in the thunderdome so like that totally works for me and then likewise at the end there the train plane car chases like everything they're doing there the stunts the explosions coming out of that it just looks super cool yes i totally agree with you that that stuff was cool yeah. But it wasn't as cool because I didn't have all these other elements of the story. I just didn't care. So I I think the story is totally lacking. I agree with you on that. One thing I was thinking about is that this it definitely pulled me in. This was a world, it pulled me in. That was good. But it felt like it was all scene setting. So it was almost like too much world building and not enough story and i feel like that's not even a product of the era of this movie making because during this era so this was me made in in the mid 80s there's there's other world building that was done at this time i mean you had total recall you had blade runner you had terminator these are these are other examples of world building or apocalypse worlds together that just this just didn't have it just had car chases so i think that's where it ultimately I felt like fell down for me a bit and and again I didn't have the nostalgia to carry me through yeah Um, it wasn't I'm gonna clutch my pearls cringy kind of thing but it was more just I'm gonna scratch my head and be like what maybe this is why it broke my brain I don't know yeah 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 closing thoughts Amanda try try to convince me that it lives up oh I don't think I can but (laughs) Um, I did enjoy revisiting this movie. Like this did take me back at least to high school, if not before that. I forgot how the grittiness of it made me feel a certain way that I'd forgotten about, like that this is really dark and really heavy. And I do you think this has stuck in my brain in terms of what is the worst thing that could happen if society breaks down and if there's an apocalypse, if climate change takes us all like, keep fighting the good fight people because we do not want to end up like this movie so (laughs) whether you like the cars or not like this is our worst case scenario yeah i feel like it is sort of a cautionary tale like oh my god guys this would be a great message if you're into environmental activism for whatever reason do you want to go to barter town i don't think you want to go to barter town so we got to fix this shit like could me, this be, be like, like a, oh, what do I need to do? I don't want to go to Barn Town. Could this be a scared straight video for like Exxon Mobil executives? It's sort of like this is your brain on drugs kind of like <laughs> thing for me. Like this is your life on apocalypse is Barter Town. Holy shit. Ooh, um bad. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd say my closing thought is that it's it's sort of like you know when you have a dream, like a bad dream or an intense dream, it's really intense in your mind, it's disjointed but it feels really important and everything feels very articulate and you wake up in that those five seconds that you wake up, you think this was really important and I need to tell someone about it. And then the moment you try to describe it, it melts out of your brain and makes no sense. And that's how I felt this movie was. It was, there was something like, Oh, Oh, okay. It was crazy. My brain is crazy. It's it's something really important. And then, and then my brain melted. (laughs) And that's, the movie is just I totally get what you're saying and I'm sorry because you're watching me like (laughs) laugh at you trying to no but I think that's what's like that seems like that's how I felt this movie was it feels intense yeah Yeah. and I want it's like I really want to be in this world I want to go back to sleep in the dream but I once you wake up you don't fucking get it (laughs) yeah it's oh god so that's my that's my closing (laughs) thought no that actually makes that's very coherent for me (laughs) i mean i i feel like i felt coherent thinking that thought and now that we're at the end of the podcast i finally have a coherent thought about this movie let's let's rate this movie then all right let's rate this movie (laughs) we're being coherent all right so everybody it's uh one to ten one is garbage ten is princess bride we do two different ratings we'll start with adults which is, did it live up to us as adults? Would you like to go first, Amanda? Did it live up to you? You're the one that has a nostalgic attachment. All right. On a scale of one to 10 for adults, 
I'm giving this a six. It <laughs> makes me feel something. It's not something good. It's slightly on the positive side in that it takes me out of our actual existence and forecasts like this is a bad place that you all do not want to end up in. So yeah. six. And, and this is where I find interesting about the exercise of our podcast that I do think nostalgia plays such a huge role. It does. It does. I, my my score is going to go lower. I know. I bet. And I got to go as low as a two. I, I'm going to give it one point for Tina Turner. And I'm going to give it one point for the for the costumes just being kind of fun. And otherwise, I just had a hard time with this one. So I'm, right. I'm fortunate. I think this is my lowest yet. It's it is. Lower you than went Rudolph. lower than you went with Rudolph. Well, <laughs> I'm giving it a two because, oh, God. No, I, I felt this coming from you. You. <laughs> yeah, I realize we keep torpedoing each other's movies that we love, uh, uh, but that's where I don't I consider this one mine, by the way. So I don't, oh, okay, good. I'm not taking this personally. <laughs> So the next the next score is does it live up to kids today or at least its intended audience, which I would think is at least teenager given. Yeah, the so this is PG thirteen. So this we cannot be considering this for five year olds. You should not be showing this to a five year old. Oh yeah, her. guys, the parents out there, this is not the one to show your kids. Yeah. Um so even as the fun score, movie in the Mad Max trilogy, this is not for children. <laughs> not for yes, yeah, the fun one involving chainsaws and shit. Yes. So one to ten. One being garbage, ten Princess Bride. Give me your teen and above rating, Amanda. I think for teenagers, I would go a four. I think the action is exciting, but I think you're right. Like the plot isn't totally comprehensible. <laughs> and I think that the action bookending it doesn't make up for the fact that the middle of this movie just really sucks. I think it's a four. I think kids would get bored. Yeah, I was going to give it a one, but I'm going to give it a two. Hey. Again, I feel like I need to give, so two for adults for me, two for kids. Again, yeah. a point for Tina Turner. And I'm giving it another point for just, it's almost a period piece. And I do think there's maybe something with climate change that could resonate. But other than that, it's just not the best representation of this kind of movie i dragged this rating down i'm sure it's of the you lowest did it's our lowest movie ever right now <laughs> below ferris bueller below rudolph the red-nosed reindeer oh sorry tina <laughs> the last thing is we have to agree is whether we in this podcast deem this movie the mad max I don't would Thunderdome beyond Thunderdome beyond Thunderdome. I see. I can't even. I think my Jess brain is, is so broken. Jess oh. is so ready to move beyond the Thunderdome. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> but does it live up? And it's a yes or no. We both have to agree. And you know, I'm a no. I do. Know I that. just I'm a no. So I'm curious what you think, though. What is yours? Knowing that you're gonna give it a no to tank it, I'm actually gonna give it a yes. Oh. Because no, but here's why. Here's why, yeah. I'm hedging because I know you sunk it already. <laughs> this put me back into when I watched it as a teenager and it made me feel the rawness of it and the chaos of it and that just being able to bring me back, I think like for me that was part of the purpose of this movie was to put you in this place that's like uncomfortable and gritty and so I think it did its job and it lives up to the the purpose that it was supposed to fulfill it's it's bringing you to a place and it's making you feel things and that's that's what is living up for me yeah I mean I think that's a good point I mean I think it definitely made me feel things and like like I said my brain is still broken so yeah it definitely had an effect on me. So respectfully, I still decline to say yep. it lives up. I don't think it lives <laughs> up. It's just, I just, oh God, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's still on fire in my brain. And I, I do, I'm glad that I've seen it though. So I'll yeah. give you that. Sorry to take this. And, you know, for everybody else out there, and I think this one in particular uh, or the whole Mad Max series has a certain resonance for people our age. And I think I'd be very curious whether people just think we're right on or that my brain is so broken that I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So please, listeners, let us know if you agree, if you disagree. We're at Live Up Pod and all the socials or at Live Up Pod at Gmail. Do you agree with us? Does this live up? What did we miss? Were we or I too harsh? Probably not. But I am curious about this one because I do think nostalgia plays a big role. 
Well, we thank you for listening. The therapy session. <laughs> Hopefully our breakdown of this movie made more sense than the movie did. <laughs> All right, everybody. Yeah.